Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Andrea and today I will be covering part two of Nonfiction November. I read three books and I started an audiobook which I did not finish. So I'll talk about those today. So uh, part of the challenges uh, that were left in the second half for me were uh, The Wonder or Wonder and Pastime. For the Wonder portion, I read A New Map of Wonders by Caspar Henderson and Henderson's writing is very similar to the way I think, which is he kind of gets distracted by a lot of things and he just goes, wow, this is so cool, this is also so cool, this is also so cool. And this book was just basically that. It connects the mystery of the universe, the wonder of life, with um, marvels within our own bodies and microsystems, like microorganisms. So it will look at the human brain, the human heart, the human imagination, and then it will look at things like the universe and life and uh, biodiversity and just so many other things. And it's accompanied by illustrations and marginalia on the side. And the marginalia, though it's also, you know, typed, it will contain kind of quotations from other people. So in many ways, this book can also send you on a path to discover new authors if you've liked a particular quotation from the side and you're like, ooh, I wonder what else this person's written. In a way, this kind of spoke to me and I really liked it. But if you prefer books that are extremely focused, maybe this is not the book for you. But if you enjoy that kind of book that really does spark wonder and you know kinds of imagination that this is something worth of picking up and i really enjoy his writing and it's accessible it's not exclusive and i really enjoyed that the second book that i uh, read and this was not part of my tbr announcement i just kind of did a switch um was the new essay book by jonathan franz and the end of the end of the earth and it felt in many ways a continuation of his essay book Further Away. Jonathan Franzen has this way of writing nonfiction, particularly essays, where he'll kind of combine a few things and somehow make sense of it all. So basically, in this essay collection, he does talk about birds a lot, but he kind of combines the topic of mob think and the way social media in general creates this kind of um, mob mentality and tribal thinking with climate change and global warming and with his love for birds. And that is this essay book in a nutshell. So for example, one of the most noteworthy um, essays is the very first one. And then a few essays later, it's the thing he references in the first essay. So basically, he wrote um, an article for The New Yorker about global warming. And in it, he talked about how it's ridiculous to deny climate change. And that's kind of like the far right. And, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to deny that this is real. But at the same time, he was saying how far left people were also very likely to be over the top optimistic. Like, you know, if we change our ways, everything will just be perfect and we will bring down the temperature by two degrees in the next 10 years. And, and in this article, he was saying, you know, we have to walk this middle line where we have to be very, very, very realistic and we can't be too optimistic. And I guess this is kind of like the friends and grouchy voice coming through. He said that after the article came out, people sort of took just one-liners from his New Yorker article and completely tore it apart on Twitter or social media and completely twisted his words against him and people were calling him a climate change denier. The, the Bird Foundation, of which he was a massive fan, kind of denounced associations with him. How he, he said, that's, that's not what I said. And he kind of takes all of this experience and brings it into this essay and sort of tackles social media again but he's also discussing mob mentality and misconstructing people's words or reappropriating them negatively. And he also looks at his love for birds and how he couldn't be further away from being a climate change denier. He then takes that and spreads it out for many essays where he'll just tell you about birds and he will make you love different kinds of birds. And he looks at them from a kind of birding expert 
perspective. There are a lot of parts of this book that were kind of like just Jonathan friends and birding all over the world. But like from time to time, I'll pop in and look at some of the things people are doing. And he like tries to engage with conversations that are happening sort of without him as he has been removed from this technological world. There was a lack of nuance in regards to technology on his part, I think. But overall, it was just kind of interesting. I, I like hearing what Franzen's essays are usually about, even though he's often very kind of grumpy or grouchy. And again, I remember that the day this came out, on Twitter there was a lot of Jonathan Franzen roasting because he gave advice to, t to new writers and people thought that his advice was not that great and it was a bit too vague and sounded too much like uh, sort of fortune cookie sayings. I just look at this book as one person's thoughts and if he were to engage in discussions, this is what it would be like. And, and I think in many ways I've kind of seen a growth in Jonathan Franzen's approach. And like with every essay collection, there are some essays that I just didn't care all that much about, so, you know, it's, it's a mix. That's Jonathan Franzen's essay book. Then I was supposed to have listened to an audiobook on mushrooms called Mycophilia, and this book was interesting. I listened to about five hours of it, and I hit my master's level on Audible, so that was pretty cool. And it led me to more books about mushrooms, about how to cook mushrooms and how to make different things and how to cultivate them. So that was really cool, uh, but I didn't finish it. So I'm not gonna really talk about it. All I can say is it will make you kind of passionate about mushrooms, but it was a, it was a good audiobook. I just, I, I got a little bit distracted. And then I accidentally read a nonfiction book and that was the, vampires book. So I was doing research for my uh, video on Romanian speculative fiction and I got so involved in kind of finding out more. This is an anthology of sorts but the first half is kind of a history book. So we'll look at the vampire from Lord Byron to pretty much Twilight and um, vampire diaries and newer media portraying vampires in the south or vampires in other forms. I really wish he would have made it all the way to Taika Waititi's What We Do in the Shadows because that's like my favorite movie of all times and it's hilarious. It's about these four vampires that share a flat together in New Zealand and they have like roommate problems even though they're vampires. It's hilarious. But this is also the second half is an anthology so it will look at all the sources for Dracula, it will look at excerpts from different vampire books and I just got so interested and involved that I just kind of accidentally read it. This happened to me before. I was doing research on Charles Darwin and his use of language and certain words that he personally coined. I don't know if people know this but the word evolution didn't show up until like the sixth edition of The Origin of Species but in the beginning he was using words like transmutation so I remember kind of looking up, like tracing back some language, and then I accidentally read this whole book about Carl Linnaeus, so went completely off rails. This happens a lot. You'll see. So that was it. That was my nonfiction November, and I actually picked up more momentum near the end. I had an excellent nonfiction November. What I really want to hear from you is, what is your favorite nonfiction book of all time? Like, I want to know what nonfiction book just kind of blew your mind and made you just so much more interested in a specific topic. And I will see you in my next video. Bye!